This man is the greatest living goal kicker in league history. This man is the hottest property in the AFL. And this man is waiting in the wings to grab his godlike mantle. Dunstall, Ablett, Carey. And they all have one thing in common. They are managed by this man. Tonight, Ricky Nixon will be Talking Footy. Hello, welcome once again to Talking Footy on the Seven Network right around Australia. Looking forward to talking to Ricky Nixon very shortly. But let's start by introducing Mark Sheehan and Malcolm Blight. As always, it's great to see both of you. How are you going, Malcolm? Good, Bruce. Terrific. That's great. Uh, and Mike? Same, Bruce. Thank you. <laughs> exactly the same as Malcolm tonight. You've never been exactly the same as Malcolm. What about the uh, Tribunal? Uh, a good result, I guess, from uh, Richmond's point of view and also from North Melbourne's point of view. Wayne Schwass, in this incident on Friday night against Matthew Phoebe, had his case withdrawn today. And Nick Daffy, in fact, you'll see Schwass's face in a moment. It wasn't his best night Friday night. He'd obviously uh, had a pretty hard week getting up and trying to make it fit. And Nick Daffy for this incident with uh, Robert Harvey, alleged trip, also had his charge withdrawn. So good news for the Tigers who play Hawthorne on Friday night. Not such good news, maybe, for the Saints because Glenn Coglin, who's uh, been a pretty promising player in his first year, has been put up on a trial by video for that incident against Chris Bond in the match between St Kilda and Richmond out at Waverley Park. What an upset that was. There are two big upsets on the weekend as we take a look at the ladder. Uh, Carlton in full flight. They've now won eight in a row. That's the best sequence so far this year. Richmond have won one out of their last five with a draw. They drop down to third. North have lost three in succession. Footscray have won five straight. Melbourne have won nine out of their last 11. To both Mike and Malcolm, will the eight remain as it is at the end of the season? I think it will, Bruce. Um, I, I'm pretty confident now that uh, Melbourne will hang on. I think Footscray will, but Melbourne still have a tough draw, but I, I'm sure that Two games plus percentage, mate. It's just too far, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think the eight best sides are in the eight at the moment. And it just, it's interesting we've been talking about the inequities in the draw, yet uh, unless there's something dramatic happens, the, uh, none of the sides out of the eight will have anything to complain about. Tell us about Carlton, because you were interested in a, a statistic from their game with Fitzroy. Well, I was. I mean, I, just, I can never remember an AFL team having 414 possessions in a game of football, which was 150-odd more than Fitzroy had. It's just, I've never known such a lopsided statistical review of a match. No, and actually, I saw David Parkins' comment too that said that you get bad habits when you do that. When the game mm. was so easy and mm. no pressure, obviously players probably just start to finish with the ball. And you prefer that not to happen. And there's another thing that none of us would prefer, I'd like to say, about Bernie Quinlan admitting that he can see defeat in the eyes of his players. And I think that was a very sad admission. Mm. That, you know, you can tell that there's a, just a look about the place that's not healthy. Yes, to remedy that overnight is not possible. No, it's going to be a long haul, isn't it? Mm. Well, big stories today. Uh, the first one concerned the uh, club managers uh, who all got together. It was surrounding the uh, proposal that uh, the fees for players rise dramatically uh, next year from 7,500 minimum up to 22,500 it's been talked about and from player payments, match payments, from $750 to $1,500. Roger Hampson from the Essendon Football Club was the spokesman for the club managers today and this was his response after their meeting this afternoon. If you consider that the salary cap has already went up $300,000 in the last year and it goes up another $300,000 uh, next, next year, that's a 25% increase in the, the salary cap uh, in the last two years. Now, the ability of all clubs to um, um, compete with that in Victoria is, is becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, it's not going to affect the West Coast who had a profit last year of 3.4 and Adelaide 2.4 and the Dockers who are expected to make a profit of 1.5 million in their first year. Uh, clubs in Victoria were battling all to get to uh, the profits of just Adelaide. That was mid-afternoon. Now since then the Players Association have met in uh, Ligon Street in a restaurant. They're still meeting. Mark Beretta from Seven Nightly News is there right now. Mark, what can you tell us uh, from the Players Association meeting tonight? Well, Bruce, at this stage, uh, they've been behind closed doors for just over an hour now. Uh, there was some discussion today, as you probably uh, heard earlier on, Ian Collins went across to talk to the club general managers this afternoon. He has since had a uh, meeting, a very brief meeting with Justin Madden, and it seems as though there may have been uh, some sort of compromise being reached at the moment. Now, Justin Madden indicated that before he went behind closed doors. He did say that that would have to receive the uh, approval of the executive and the executive are currently meeting. As we said, they've been behind closed doors for about an hour now and uh, uh, all indications seem to be that they'll be there for some time uh, 
still to come. Mark, I believe that a number of the clubs are not represented tonight on the executive. Yeah, that's true. Uh, ten players on the executive tonight uh, representing seven clubs. The clubs that are not represented include uh, North Melbourne, Geelong, St Kilda, uh, Fitzroy and of course the interstate clubs, West Coast, Brisbane, Sydney, uh, Adelaide and Fremantle not represented tonight. Well, Mark, uh, we'll go back to you if uh, we do get a result whilst talking footy's going to air. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Mark Verda from Seven Nightly News. Time now to welcome our guest, Ricky Nixon. The manager of Club 10. Ricky, welcome to Talking Footy. It's great to have you on the program. Thanks, Bruce. Could I start by asking the relationship between your Club 10 at the elite level more? I know that you've got well over 100 players now on your books. That relationship with the Players Association? Well, the Players Association are there uh, to look after the needs of all players and uh, no doubt tonight they're the sort of issues they'll be discussing. What are the needs of all the players collectively? But uh, it's disturbing when uh, four or five clubs aren't represented tonight and uh, I'm led to believe that perhaps players weren't even notified of the meeting to as late as sort of four or five o'clock this afternoon. Ricky, is the Players Association doing the job it was set up to do? Well, it's always been a difficult uh, job in... in in light of the fact that uh, it's a part-time employee who's trying to carry out three or four jobs at once and... Uh, We're talking about Peter Allen. Peter Allen, who's also uh, acting on behalf of the Basketball Association mm. as well and trying to run a business as well. And it, it's not an easy job and uh, particularly in light of the fact that the next four or five years are an important part of the AFL competition for the players with a lot of changes happening, pay TV and marketing rights and all those sort of issues. Ricky, I, I would have thought that with such an important meeting such as this one, that, that the clubs aren't all represented. I mean, I just can't believe if the players... I think they've got a fair beef too. I think those younger players should get more. Why they're not there? I, I mean, I'm staggered. Well, I know I spoke to uh, two club delegates, and I won't name them, but late tonight or 8 o'clock tonight, and they only had messages left this afternoon about the meeting tonight, and I, I find that pretty poor. Club mm. 10, uh, the high-profile players, uh, we've talked about Ablett and Dunstall and uh, also Carey at the start of the program. They include Lockett. Etc. Who, who thought of the colours, Ricky? By the way, <laughs> <laughs> don't own up. Just looking there, I was just thinking maybe they should play the Victorian side and not yeah. the Allies. Uh, maybe Sorry. it should be Club Ten versus the Big V, uh, Michael. Sorry, bro. <laughs> well, no, it was interesting. The Allies uh, had a very similar, similar jumper colour, yeah. uh, a couple of weeks later. It'd be almost like uh, there's a lot of reactive sort of stuff going on, Mike. Maybe. Mm. Perhaps who is Ricky? Ricky, yes, it is. <laughs> Ricky uh, we've had enormous problems worldwide uh, with players versus, I guess, uh, officialdom and administration. A number of strikes, particularly in America, in all sorts of uh, sports over the last four or five years. I read with interest on the weekend that uh, there might be a strike in the AFL. Is that uh, a possibility, do you think? Look, I was fairly disappointed, Bruce, to read that sort of stuff in the papers because it's, it's a lot of media hype as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it certainly wasn't suggested by myself. Look, if a player doesn't sign a registration form, he can't play in the competition. But the registration form we're talking about is for next season. And, uh, you know, we've got till next April to sort out that issue, hopefully. And uh, no doubt the players who are representing clubs tonight will talk about that issue. But I would imagine that Peter Allen would speak to the uh, absentees, so to speak, tonight and see what their uh, views from the clubs are as well. Ricky, are the players being looked after? I mean, there's a perception now that they're not, but the average player payment in league football these days is $64,000. Now, that to me seems a pretty healthy return for a, a game that's only played in Australia and probably only half of Australia. Yeah, I think what you've got to respect, Mike, is that averages or figures can speak all sorts of things. And, uh, you know, the top players are paid, I believe, probably about what they're worth. Um, but I think that the bottom scale of players is certainly underpaid, particularly when we're getting more and more towards a professional competition. Mm. I mean, when I, you know, during the week I speak to a number of people and they're surprised to learn that clubs are training at 10 o'clock in the morning with weight sessions and 2 o'clock for skills sessions now and then the whole team gets together at 5 o'clock again. And it's I think we all accept that and I think even the AFL accepts it. I don't think there's any doubt that the, uh, the minimum rate will go to... Twenty-two and a half thousand and fifteen hundred dollars a game. So mm. that's no longer an issue. I think after in the next few do, days. Do you think it'll still go to twenty-two? By the way. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt they'll get that uh, the AFL all agree to that. Do you, isn't that. Is that your understanding of it? It's a three. Well, I think the AFL. It is. Yeah. I think yeah. the AFL will agree to it purely and simply because they've put it up. Mm. Do you think so, it's in the oh. AFL's best interest? I mean, the AFL look like they want to raise obviously the salary cap. Is what do you think their motives are for that? Because they they want the players to be well rewarded. Well, I think they're probably, uh, they probably do want the players to be well rewarded, but you wonder if there's any hidden agenda and, uh, of course, uh, I guess the clubs who aren't financially well off at the moment would believe that there is a hidden agenda, but it just makes me wonder well, why... Well, not being able to uh, 
Well, it was only to, to compete at that level. It was only two years ago that the AFL wouldn't even meet with the Players Association on certain aspects, and now they're buddy buddies and almost in bed together. Has your relationship with Ross Oakley changed over the last three or four months? Oh, certainly not. I mean, I respect what Ross Oakley's done, and and, and I think that he's turned the AFL competition around in the last decade. To uh, you know, it's it's a well-supported competition. We're now playing at the best venues. Um, you know, really the competition's thriving. I think he's done a fantastic job, but. At the same time, I think that there's certain aspects of the AFL administration that don't do things that well. You don't think the $35 million a year that goes to the players is an adequate amount? Well, I think I read in the paper an article that you wrote, Mike, about quoting uh, Diesel or Greg Williams, that the fact that it's a billion dollar industry and you question that. But really, if you take in all facets of the game, uh, whether it's TV rights, it's, it's right through to merchandising, gate receipts, it is a billion dollar industry. Billion dollar? How much, uh, just on the... Uh, elite payments, you said you believe they were getting enough. Super League players, Ricky Stewart's going to get a million dollars, we believe, next year. I guess someone like Lockett would be on four or five hundred thousand. There's a big difference now between the top of AFL and the top of Rugby League. They're comparable competitions. AFL, in fact, is a stronger one Australia-wide in many respects. Yeah, I'll clarify that, Bruce, by saying they're paid on a restrictive uh, scenario. In other words, there's a salary cap in place. And basically to pay a player of the calibre of Ablett or Carey or Dunstall or whoever it might be that's in that top echelon, um, in a restrictive environment such as the salary cap and draft restrictions, they're being paid virtually to their maximum. It mightn't be what they're worth, and I'll clarify it in saying that I think they're worth more, but they're being paid only by what they can be paid. Do you expect the salary cap would be challenged in the next few years in a court of law? Well, it's probably been rumoured for a long time that, it, that uh, both the salary cap and the draft will be challenged, but uh, ultimately it comes back to whether the players are happy and the clubs are happy. But aren't those mechanisms in place to protect the lower clubs? Oh, I would suggest that uh, they're in place to even up the competition, aren't they, Mike? Yeah, that's, and, and to protect the lower clubs. That's notionally the idea of it. Well, you've only got to look at I mean, tonight I've been at a function to honour uh, um, Robert D. P. Domenico and he spoke about Hawthorne's reign in the last 13 years and the fact that you know, now the club faces a real challenge because of the draft and the salary cap. They haven't been able to retain players. They've had to lose players such as Brayton and Ayres and the twilight of their careers because of salary cap problems. And, you know, it's to even up the competition. Now, you probably argue that crowds have gone up and, uh, you know, the co competition's never been healthier. And uh, is that a reason to bring down the draft and salary cap? Well, we'll leave it at that. Um, lots more to talk about. and. Uh, one man in particular who you have a very close association with is Gary Ablett. Uh, let's leave this first segment uh, with Gaz's 100th goal on Saturday. On one knee, hand passes, did well, found Pickering. Brewer back to couch, who's been superb. His first hand pass of the afternoon, back to Brewer, who goes looking for and finds Ablett. Now this should be it. So Ablett for the century. He's got it. It's all over. And I think he's glad about it. For the third successive season, Gary Ablett has got the century. And Dennis, he's the oldest ever at 33, and he's the first captain ever to kick 100 goals in a season. Manager, I read this article from October last year that Mike Sheehan, who's on this program, had written. It's slightly out of context. It's the first paragraph and the third one. Ricky Nixon was 10 years playing 63 games at AFL level. It is safe to suggest he'll have a far more profound impact on football during the next 10 years. He is emerging as the face of sports management of the 1990s in Australia. Maybe even football's Mark McCormack, the founder of IMG. Well, I know that Mark McCormack was offered a billion dollars for his company from Phil Knight, who owns Nike. You're in a good spot, I reckon, Ricky. How are you going? Well, I don't know about the billion dollars. Uh, take oh, off I want a bit of it. <laughs> <laughs> take off about six zeros, I think. Uh, hang on, there, there is a bit of a relationship going on here, Mark. That's a fantastic promotion, Mike. You're very, very good at promoting blokes, aren't you? And early. getting it right. Early. Early. Thanks, very good Malcolm. call. Very nice. Excellent. Well, I said to him before, Malcolm, he needs to do the top button and the top <laughs> if he's going to make himself marketable. <laughs> you don't market... Um, journalists or uh... oh we do look after a few media people and uh, i mean actually we've found in the last three or four months that football is now a hundred percent of our time we're taking up a hundred percent of our time which is indicative of the way the game's going now and uh, we've had to drop actually uh, other sports people off our books tell us about gary ablett a bit as we look at the goal kickers and see that uh, 
Gary on uh, 104 for the third time in a row. Um, we know all the records he's breaking. Rocker, Locket, Lion. I've got a feeling Lion will kick 100 this year. If they play two finals, I think he can make it. Low and Dunstall. It's interesting that a lot of those players, you obviously like goal kickers, are on Club 10. It says something about the fame of goal kickers in our game. On Saturday, when Gary arrived at the ground uh, in preparation for the big day, um, it was interesting. When I was in Chicago, lucky enough to have a chat to Michael Jordan a couple of years ago, he's driven right up to the gate. The door's open for him. He walks straight through. There's no contact with anybody. I mean, Gary looks pretty relaxed about it all. And then the big occasion. Have you had a chance to chat to him about the day and the build-up and how he feels about all of it? Well, it's certainly interesting on Friday night. I, I'd probably spoken to him four or five times on the phone during the day about business matters, and then uh, it just dawned on me that I didn't wish him luck for the following day. And I phoned <laughs> yeah, it says him and something said, that does. Yeah, and uh, phoned him probably about seven o'clock and said, you know, good luck tomorrow. I hope you get the three goals. And uh, his first comment was, oh, well, you've got to rely on the team and uh, it's a team game. And I've got no doubt that Gary Ablett is just enjoying his football. And uh, he's one of the most relaxed people about, or players, playing the game. He just enjoys playing. And I think that he, that's one of the reasons that he's got that longevity about his career and that he just enjoys playing the game. What sort of business matters would you discuss with him on the day before a game? You mentioned four or five. Give us one or two. Well, he's in huge demand. We'd get you know, anything up to 10 phone calls a day for Gary and, and the mail is, is just astronomical and Geelong Football Club would testify to that. I mean, I think three weeks after last year's grand final they had a huge cardboard box that would have had a thousand letters in it and he's just so popular across Australia. He outsells Michael Jordan in memorabilia. Um, you know, the, the sort of calls we'd expect to get are just appearances um, through to endorsements. He just, uh, believe it or not, he did his first endorsement for Nestle uh, last October. Ten years of league football did his first endorsement and uh, it was a huge success. They turned over more Milo tins they've ever uh, sold in their career, I think, in Australia. Can I just take that one step further? We're talking about before and maybe the AFL being seen to take too much out of what rightfully belongs to the players, in your view. As I understand it, Gary Ablett's video last year earn him $120,000 mm -hmm. and that was done in conjunction with the AFL, is that correct? It was done, yeah, by the AFL licensee, certainly, mm -hmm. and uh, the AFL licensee pays a royalty to the AFL of which the player gets nothing. But he got 120 grand out of that no, video. No, that's quite incorrect to say that he got 120 grand. Gary Ablett, the, Ab the Ablett video was actually done two years ago and he's only been paid his first cheque this year for the video and I can tell you it was nowhere near $100,000. How does he, uh, we'll have a look at his press conference after the, the game. Um, Malcolm, you've obviously known him pretty well too, um, having coached him for half a dozen years. This was Gary uh, after the game, uh, and Dipper did the interview for, for Seven Sport. I would have liked to have got it over last week, got it over and done with, but uh, that's football, and uh, so I'm just glad it's uh, you know, out the way now. Very relieved when you kicked the 100 today. Yeah, I was. Uh, after missing three there in the uh, second term, uh, I, was, you know, I was very relieved to get it over and done with early in the third quarter. Is he becoming more comfortable with all of that? I think he is, Bruce, but uh, I mean, you know, I think I've only known him for a short period of time, possibly 18 months ago he came to us and, uh, you know, the thing I, I guess that I've become accustomed to now is that uh, we're not Gary Ablett and I think everybody expects things of Gary Ablett. I think we expect him to, to come onto TV shows and present himself and give interviews and in the end, surely it's up to the individual and, and we can't demand that, that they do certain things. and. Uh, Look, Gary's starting to open up a little bit. I mean, he went to Taralgon and Sale last week and 5,000 people respectively, each venue turned up at shopping centres to see him. His, his popularity is huge and uh, even on the west coast of America, they idolise him and, uh, you know, he's, it's a mystique, I think, a little bit about him as well that uh, just adds to it. Well, I'm sure if he sits on that couch, we'll all go like this, <laughs> won't we, Mike? We, we, don't, we won't ask him any questions. And you talked about memorabilia a moment ago and Michael Jordan. The number five at Geelong, I know the clubs uh, haven't retired numbers too often. Or, I mean, do you think this will be retired uh, at the end of Gary's career? I think, I think most clubs probably attempt to do that at some stage, Bruce, but... I was talking to Mike earlier and unfortunately you end up with 48, the, the next bloke that comes on your list gets number 48 and it's pretty hard to retire jumpers, there's been some fantastic players over the years but I'm sure they'll put it away for a little while. Who would have thought that after Polly Farmer that G. Mm. Ablett would have mm. followed it and between that was uh, of course David Barclay. Mm. I think it's worth some thought, your point's valid but I think Witten, um, Ablett and even Farmer I mean at that time I think people of that quality maybe we should think about it. Yeah. Ricky, how long has he contracted to play for the Geelong Football Club? At what age would he retire, do you think, under this next contract? 
Well, I think he's certainly, he's certainly signed a new contract with Geelong for the next couple of years, but I guess at the start of this season, a lot of people doubted uh, whether Gary could go on, and he's certainly proven that, you know, he probably has got one, two, three, four years left. I, I spoke to Michael Turner, an ex-captain of the club, uh, a few months ago, and Michael thought that he could play till probably 38. So, you know, I think it's probably a, a year-by-year -year proposition, but uh, certainly on his form this year, he could continue through. Well, Malcolm, you've said in, uh, in your column in the Australian this morning that he would get to 37. Yeah, look, I just think that Gary actually started football later than most. I mean, when I say that, at the, at the elite level. And I've always felt that uh, because of his natural enthusiasm for the game, which he really does love playing, and secondly, just the way he looks after himself, I really do think in that position of full forward now, he can play for another two or three years, and certainly 37 would be possible. You know, I even made a comment about Michael Tuck, uh, you know, got to mm. 38, and I, I've just, I'm just sure he, he, he loves Tucky, and mm. they're a pretty good family, and pretty tight family, and I could just imagine him saying, gee, what, if I can just eat out another year, another year to beat Tucky. Well, or Tucky like reckons he had five left, didn't he? <laughs> 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 that would leave him with a couple still yeah. to go. Your article was interesting in The Australian this morning. You talked about uh, Gary not going to a couple of training sessions in your first year there in 89, and you said this the following, well, not wanting confrontation, I simply wanted to do what I felt was best. This is where you felt that Ablett wasn't going to go to a third session. To explain he had to fall into line and try to instill a sense of team discipline. Motioning to one of the uh, treated pine footbridges, I said, either you'll walk over that bridge with me or I'm going to push you off. In other words, you know, you're gone from the club in 89. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's obviously true. Um, but, and I think that that was my first real introduction to Gary Ablett. And, uh, you know, you'd heard a lot of stories about him and something like that. But the rest of the article then goes on and say, says that what Gary's done to turn himself around. I mean, he could have easily gone that night and never returned. But I think the quality of the bloke at that stage of his career, I think Gary made his mind up that he really did want to play footy. And, I mean, it, then it eulogises all that he's done since. And uh, I think it's more credit to Gary than most people give him for. Well, Bob Pratt likes him too. Bob Pratt, uh, an absolute legend. John Elliott suggested here last week that he was one of the greatest. He holds the record with Peter Hudson, 150 goals in a season. He kicked a consecutive 100 goals in three years uh, in the 1930s. Came back in 46 to play as well. This is what Bob had to say about uh, Gary Ablett. I don't go to the football that much now. I watch it a lot. But to go and watch some forward, I wouldn't go. Yeah. But to go and watch Ablett, that's a day out for me and it's a pleasure. I think he's, he's, he is marvellous. But then again, I'll say something else, perhaps I shouldn't say, that he gets away with a lot that I could never get away with when I played. Without being too boastful, Robert, does he remind you of him, of, uh, of yourself? Well, he does. He does some of the things that I used to do, yeah, we'll say that. Did you, would you have made as many great marks in your career as he's making? Oh, I'd take... You would I'd take... I'd take half a dozen of those a day at least. You would? Yeah. Well, Perhaps two or three a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Davis with Bob Pratt. <laughs> That's fantastic, isn't it? I, I mean, he must have been... I mean, I'm just sorry you don't get a chance to see that, but mm. he must have been some player. Well, well, Bob Davis said a week ago that he's still the greatest full forward he's seen. He said, he said off Pratt. Mm. Actually, it's, it's interesting, Bruce, too, that uh, you picked up on the fact that the leading goal kickers, uh, probably six of the leading eight goal kickers are in Club 10. It's a proven fact over the last five years since I've been involved in the business that players who mark the ball or alternatively mark it and kick goals are the most marketable. And it's, it's interesting, someone like him. Bob, whether uh, he would have been in Club 10 50 years ago. <laughs> what about Malcolm Blight? He would have been a good Club 10. Well, pick. I think he would have been. He would have been a bit of a walk-up start, old Malcolm. There yeah, are two folks who mark the ball pretty well at the moment, Ricky. Uh, uh, Matthew Richardson and James Hurd, who are unaligned to the best of my knowledge. Why hasn't one of the groups uh, snapped them up so far? Well, it was important when we started the group that it was made to uh, be elite. And I guess uh, if you have someone of the calibre of Gary Ablett in it, you just can't throw every player into the group. It's got to be a marketable group. It's got to be a group that every supporter from, from three years old through to 103 respects as being the better players in the competition. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of twos and fours and for, for players, whether they are marketable or not, and whether they actually have the credentials on the field. And uh, I think certainly Matthew Richardson's in, in his infancy as far as marketability goes, but he was a standout before he did his knee. I think he'll be an outstanding player when, when he comes back. He's working hard to come back. And James Hurd as well. Um, you know, there's no reason why two players from one club, we've obviously got Wanganeen involved at the moment, that James Hurd's uh, 
you know, right on the uh, step of uh, coming into Club 10. Well, Dunstall's in the group. Uh, we sh really should pay respect to the fact that whilst he didn't have a huge day in terms of goals, he passed Doug Wade. He's now the kick more goals than any other living uh, full forward. We've done a column about that tomorrow, Bruce. I just don't think, it, maybe because of the personality of the guy involved and, and, and his club, but it's just, it's a staggering achievement though, isn't it? I mean, he's, no one on the planet has kicked more goals than this guy. No, I, I mean, I just, I, I was amazed at this kick. Jason, if yeah. you're watching, uh, what sort of kick was it? <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you kick a lot of good goals, but to break the, or to be the best all time living, uh, it was the most wobbliest kick I've ever seen him do. Peter Hudson with about 15 more metres on it. <laughs> we look at the all-time, uh, Gordon Coventry, of course, deceased. Jason and Tony and Gary, three of the top six. Uh, Jason just going past Doug Wade. Look, we all love calling goals and calling marks. There's a guy that's uh, calling footy at the moment. Uh, he's a Latin. He calls in the United States. I think the AFL are going to try and get him out this year for the final series. He was doing a game uh, not too long ago, not this season, but between Geelong and Hawthorne at Cadinia Park. He's a pretty good commentator. Listen to this. Jugador de apoyo muy hábil y versátil. Continúa la acción. El balón frente al gol. Hable con la patada. Media vuelta. Sí, señor. Gol para Gary Ablett. Al ataque Quilón. La entrega de por puño por parte de Couch. Continuó el ataque, Hinckley con la balón, largo, largo. Sí, señor, gol para Gillon, gol para Ken Hinckley. Alto, buscando. Cuidado, la patada Couch, alta, buscando. Y no, señor, se desvió y recibe el punto de consuelo, el behind. <laughs> Not bad, is it? <laughs> Geelong. Senor. No, senor. How would you be having uh, Rex and that gentleman calling the game at the MCG? Actually, that'd probably be pretty good together, I think. Actually, they'd probably sound fairly similar, wouldn't they? <laughs> you said that. You're working for Magic. I know the opposition at the moment. Uh, we're going to take a break. We're going to look at some of the goals of the weekend. Demon skipper Gary Lyon. Smith goes early over the back. Gary Lyon off the ground. Brilliant. What a goal. The great man, Ablett. Oh, he beats his man, Dunkley, magnificently. Gary Ablett goes to goal and should kick it. Then, oh, don't tell me. I think he might have kicked it anyway. The centre of Mc... Dean McRae. Carry now McRae judged it well. McRae is away. This should be a goal. He runs to centre half forward. Nobody at home. He goes long and it bounces through. Well worked. To Somerville. Somerville. James Hurd for the bump. Towards the half forward line. Towards full forward. Push towards goal. Suck it up the ground by Hurd. Great goal by James Hurd. Roger Merritt. Playing in front. Look at the pace of Roger. He'll play for another 10 years. <laughs> Kicks a long bump. This could bounce. It could skid through. Tonight is Ricky Nixon, the manager of Club 10. The big story to uh, break on the weekend uh, in the Herald Sun on uh, Saturday morning was the fact that uh, a night grand final was oh. certainly possible. Are you live here, Mike? I can't tell if you're live or not. I didn't realise it was such a big story, actually. <laughs> I can't it's remember big, seeing your photo on the front page. It's the biggest page. picture bowl I've ever seen. Eh? <laughs> How did you get that story, Mike? Um, I was at a luncheon a week earlier at a football game and just, as we often do, just talk to people who have positions of influence in football and it just sparks an idea. I rang Tony Peak and said I wanted to talk to him about a night grand final. I wanted to talk to Ross Oakley actually and uh, he arranged for me to speak to him. Well it stimulated a tremendous amount of discussion on the weekend. Uh, it did. Yeah, I... It's not, it's, uh, I mean the, the subject's been up before but I think now there's a real chance in my mind that uh, the AFL Commission will look at it for the centenary year next can, year. Can, Michael, can I just ask the question, if, and I did some numbers on this today after we talked about it yesterday on the, on the Sports World Footy Panel. If 18% of the games, and I added them up, 32 mm. out of 176 are played in the daytime, every other major sporting event around the world still does it in day. We've got a little letter today from... You, you uh, mean 18% 18, 18 at night? 18% at night, yeah. sorry. Yeah. The one day in September committee, thanks for that. Every other major sporting event 
is uh, done in the day. Why, why would we try and be different under those two criteria? Well, I think there are two reasons uh, that the AFL would look seriously at this. One is that uh, they would want a special, ultra-special event for the centenary year. And I know Ross personally is very keen on the, uh, the attraction of, of the fireworks and stuff like that at night events. So there is a sort of a different dimension for events at night. The, the second, there's no. two things. One, one is that. One is the entertainment package. And the other is the chance to take the biggest day in football into the promotional areas of Queensland and New South Wales in prime time. Now, but, they're the two stated reasons. But can, you can do that during the day anyhow. And secondly, surely the game's the entertainment, not firecrackers going off boom, boom. Well, I agree with that, yeah. <laughs> do you think that uh, there's any consideration to the players, Mike? I mean, they, they change things consistently. They change the... Uh, the venues at will, they change yeah. the, the, you know, well, we're, going around, we're going around with footballs with uh, Challenge Bank on them at the moment. We, so. we, you and I have a different view about this. I mean, I think that the players, by and large, are well looked after in this game. And I think that the people who run so the game... So because you're well looked say, after, you should do as you're told? No, the people who run the game are entitled to, to uh, in the, in the to promotional sense... To dictate well, well, you can dictate or sort of encourage or suggest or so whatever you, you want to call you it. you should sit in the corner and do as you're told. But Ricky, no, it's not that. are you saying that uh, you believe most players would be against a night grand final? Well, I'm not sure. I just think they should be, you know, basically asked the question of what they think of a night grand final and whether they think it's... Uh, I mean, they are the performers. They're the people who put well, on the show after all. They, they do train at five o'clock at night. Their mm -hmm. bodies are used to performing in the evening. I mean, I, I'm, to be truthful, I'm actually going to sit on the fence on this. I love day grand finals, but I don't see a big problem. When you look at the big oh, picture internationally... Oh, look, Bruce, I be suggesting that they, they may approve of a night grand final. Well, I mean, when you look at the big picture internationally, World Cup final in Italy four years ago was at night. The Super Bowl is now in the evening. The World Series that was always played on a Saturday and a Wednesday afternoon is now played generally more at night than in the daytime. So precedents have been set right around the world. It doesn't mean that we should, it should follow. But look, we have had two night finals in Melbourne on Saturday nights. They were both highly successful matches. This one was the first in 1993 when Essendon played Carlton. And the following year, Malcolm, you were involved in the thriller with Footscray. What, what, I Carlton, I think, have only played one night game. I mean, surely, mm. If, mm. If, if I mean, the, the draw's got to be done at the start of the year, so there's more games played. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Perhaps they will do point. that next yeah. year. Yeah. Perhaps yeah. they but will do that. Fine to talk about it, and I, I agree with Ricky too. I mean, there's got to be some players involved. What about getting the spectators that turn up and watch it? And the social injustices to all those people that go to the grand final breakfasts have got a whole 12 hours to get through before they get to the yeah, game. Yeah, I know that, but the very purpose of this is much better than what we've had in the past with the AFL, coming out and sort of saying, you will play a night grand final next year at 8 o'clock. It is now being debated, and I'm surely that's got to be healthy. Well, Tim Watson kicked the last goal in that match. Uh, he kicked three in that game, and uh, I, I chatted to him in the uh, newsroom uh, a couple of hours ago and asked him about uh, night grand final and he thought it was a good idea, and he also felt that uh, perhaps the spectators will have to get used to it. Oh, sure. Look, I, I always think about what the spectator thinks, but at the end of the day, I don't think that we can put the whole game or the progression of the game in the hands of the spectators because there would have been a lot of decisions that weren't made that should have been made over the years by doing that. And I think that... I think people... Well, look, people support night football. You only have to look at the crowds this year. There's been some of the biggest crowds at night football this year. So you'd have to say that the average supporter does support night football. And I don't think it's going to stop just because it's a night grand final. Tim Watson, who uh, played in those great premierships in the daytime for Essendon over the last decade. Oh, Bruce, I, I mean, I think that it, it needs talking about. Mm. To do it is wrong. To do it right now, to do it this year, I think is wrong. No, they won't do it this no. year. No, well, even next year. I think it's going to take some time. They've got to get the draw right. There's, surely there's more problems in football than whether we play a night grand final or not. Do you think night football affects the results of matches? I think it does. I think it's a different game. I mean, the ball is on the ground a bit more. You do get that dew on the ground. It's a different type of player. You might be one or two players out. Do you think aesthetically it's a better game to watch? No, I don't think it is. T to be perfectly honest, unless a perfectly dry night with a bit of breeze around to keep the stickiness or the... Uh, Dew off the ground, and secondly, perspiration's also bad. I don't think it's as good a game. There has been some good games, don't get me wrong, but I think the skills of the players better in the day. What's the mechanism here, Mike, if uh, the AFL Commission really want it for next year? How do they go about bringing it in? Well, I think they do. Ricky touched on a point before about consulting the players, and I'm sure they'll do that. I mean, this is one time where this is in, out in being debated publicly 15 months before it might, may happen. Might it be longer than that, but... 
to me, it's just a very healthy way of doing it. In this context, I'm not here to sort of say that we should have it, but I'm certainly here to say that it's a good idea to have some debate about it. I, I agree with that, Michael, but I just think the draw has got to be fixed up first, and aligned with that has got to be some more night games for other teams. So you're yeah. saying a balance of night yeah. football yep. and not dominated by yeah. certain clubs? Sure. All right. Uh, well, they've got time to do that if, in fact, it does happen next year in 1996. Port Adelaide, I wonder if they'll uh, come in in 1996. They're running a campaign at the moment, a commercial campaign in South Australia. Here's their ad. 125 years of success is the foundation for Port Adelaide AFL. We're building the ultimate team based on two foundation supporter groups, Port Legends and Port Premiers. Available for individuals, syndicates, companies or families and priced from as low as $50. Each offers seat anchoring, the right to reserve seats for the next five years. Call 1300 36 19 96 for details. Show your support for Port Adelaide and be a part of AFL history. It's only a professional club and they look well organised, so we're not, no one really knows what's going to happen in that situation. John Elliott made a good point last week, didn't he, saying that we're in a, a battlefield at the moment and we don't have much time after that to organise ourselves in terms of an October 31. Yeah, certainly, Bruce, I'd have to say they're uh, a little bit more advanced than Fremantle were at the same time. Uh, probably the only difference is that Fremantle had the concessional draft picks when quite a number of high-profile or better players were out of contract. I think the problem Port Adelaide are going to face is that there's not a lot of highly credentialed players out of contract this year that are going to be there when they have the, if they come in and have concessional picks. But uh, they're certainly more advanced than Fremantle were, if it uh, can be any more daunting mm. than it sounds. What about a couple of your big names, Stuart Lowe and Nathan Burke? What's the situation? Well, we've certainly uh, spoken. I spoke to St Kilda again today, and uh, they're working hard to um, get some sort of deal together, and they're, they're uh, talking to the players again possibly this week and hopefully we can resolve it. Now there's a suggestion that Robert Harvey's contract with St Kilda was conditional on the other two being landed. Is, is, do you know anything about that? No I don't and uh, I mean I'd find that fairly extraordinary if that was the yeah, case. Me I mean uh, I think it's a good position for Stuart Lowe and Nathan Burke to be in if that is the mm. case but I don't think you can work contracts around that based on the fact that innuendo suggests that uh, another player's got a clause in his contract mm. subject to that. Well, lighten it up a bit. I remember you saying that about Neil Curley in the very first program, Mike. Lighten it up, because the toss of the coin was <laughs> funny on, uh, on Friday night. Two guys are in Club 10, two of your men, uh, Wayne Carey and Gary Lyon. Confused us all. Um, what was Wayne up to here? Because Gary, I think, won the toss. Have a look at that. <laughs> well, actually, this, oh, this is true. I actually saw it. Neil Ke talking about Neil Curley. <laughs> Gary saying, we're kicking that way. Lyon called line. heads and won the toss. Has Kerry tried this before? I think he has, uh, Bruce. I think he tried it against Robert Harvey at Waverley a few weeks ago when, in fact, the umpires didn't have a coin. So uh, Wayne Kerry just said, well, well, we'll go this way, halves, and, the, and he just ran down to the huddle. But uh, the umpires pulled him up pretty quickly and found a coin from the crowd and tossed it. So uh, maybe he's renowned for the uh, tossing of the coin tricks. A few captains have been. Yeah, well, legendary story about Neil Curley in Adelaide that he actually had a dead set two-headed coin. He always got his trainer to come out and give it to the umpires. Always won the toss on windy days, girls. <laughs> dead set two-headed coin. <laughs> he's watching tonight, Malcolm. I hope you're right. Let's have a look at some of the marks of the round. Smith for Melbourne. Kick from the kick in a long one. Oh. Great mark. This. John Barnes, Geelong. Kick inside the 50. Barnes. High kick. Voss. Still in the set. Oh, terrific mark. Voss almost a mark. Turley takes it. Chris the Lewis for the Eagles. Step at goal. Guess who? Chris Lewis. Monday's experts. Mike Sheehan, Malcolm Blight, Ricky Nixon tonight. And uh, I know, Mike, you were pretty excited about a couple of the goals you saw over the weekend. I don't know if I was all that excited, Bruce. I was talking about the, the, way, the, the way in which Gary Lyon and Robert Harvey kicked goals, and it was the second week in a row that I'd seen Lyon uh, just use his natural right foot, almost, to my mind, deliberately, rather than risk... Uh, and he's good enough, I know, to play, to use his left foot, but again, here in the, in the Harvey case, they've used their natural foot. Now, I just wondered what Malcolm's views were about whether there's a... A, a new way of kicking goals evolving amongst these blokes. I, look, I do think you're right, Mike. I think the blokes' skills are better. But sometimes when you get into a gate of running, you just feel natural as the ball hits. So what you do, your mind just reacts to it under pressure. You're, both of them are under pressure, and you just actually do that, kick the ball on the outside of your foot. I, I think it's been going a long time. I think what's happening now is blokes are getting better at it. Do you think mm. we'll see more of it in field play, Malcolm, where I, they're using the, the check side type of kick? Well, I think so. I mean, it's, it's basically, as I said, once you get into that gate and you feel a body coming at you, you quickly throw it on your boot. But Harvey, you know, Harvey's was clearly a deliberate choice to do that. Oh, yeah. He got clear. Yeah, a lot of players have done that. In fact, I can remember getting dragged for doing one of those a few years ago. 
kicking a left foot from the boundary line, left foot check side, and uh, that was a no-no in those days. Actually, mm. Malcolm, I noticed a change in Harvey's game on the weekend in that uh, he certainly attempted to kick goals on the weekend. I think he kicked two from memory, and uh, he certainly made an attempt to get around opponents uh, probably from 70 out and, and avoid the low lead and actually kick for goal. And there's no doubt that Elves has probably said to Rob Harvey, you've got to kick goals as a rucker over. You can get 30 to 40 possessions. We know he's an outstanding player, but he certainly could be a goal kicker now for St Kilda, which is great. Yeah, I think it's a fair point. Uh, I, I noticed Michael Longan again on the weekend doing the same thing, Ricky. He's actually now shooting for goal from 30 metres out, which is terrific. Mm. Adds another dimension to him. Well, it but, does. What about Brisbane last night? It was one of the big upsets in Adelaide. It was an awful night for footy, uh, but they did it very, very well. This was a... Symbolic. I mean, McRae beaten in the one and then cuts it off and Fletcher to kick a goal. And the camaraderie between Robert Walls and his players last night was very evident. And the camaraderie between the, the players as a group. I mean, look at this at three-quarter yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> Tremendous football shot, that. It's actually the, one of your worst fears as a coach, going out three-quarter time. Except when you're down. That's the worst feeling. And getting rained upon. Oh, I, I, I just bring up, yeah, they really are happy lot, aren't look, they? Look at, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You see Lawrence and Voss here. This yeah. is a beauty. Look at the two boys, the two kids. Just practice a bit. <laughs> it, what is this? I mean, suddenly the job next year, yeah. after five great quarters of football, becomes uh, more attractive. Yeah, I, I know that uh, five five quarters don't make a season, but I, I, I thought that. I mean, I, I would have loved to have seen Robert Walls just stay on a year, to be honest, just to uh, to finish it off. You can just feel something's almost about to happen. We spoke to uh, Ross Lyon on the radio on the weekend. He's very excited about next year, considering their injuries, and, and I think it's a plum job for any coach who comes in. Mm. All right. Uh, Let's go back to Lygon Street. Mark Beretta's in. I believe we have Justin Madden. Uh, has, the has the players' meeting uh, broken up, has it, Mark? Yes, it certainly has, Bruce. Uh, Justin Madden has had the players or the uh, executive behind closed doors for just over two hours. And, uh, Justin, many, many developments uh, so far tonight. I guess the first one to start with is base salaries for players. Where do we stand with that at the moment? Well, uh, I suppose the most important thing is that players reinforce the direction we're heading with our, uh, our discussions with the league in terms of our collective bargaining agreement and that is to maintain our push for uh, a minimum base salary of just just on 22,000, a bit more than $22,000 uh, for a base and $1,500 per senior game. So uh, on top of that too, I mean with so many issues talked about tonight, we also had the issue of the uh, the players and their images and likenesses being used. What was the outcome on that, Justin? Yeah, once again, the players... Uh, uh, reinforced with the direction that we we're heading and uh, that was to to maintain our discussions with the league and, and continue to push for the players to have uh, rights over their image and likeness uh, but once again that was qualified that uh, that the league be allowed to maintain uh, i suppose the uh, their ability to uh, keep players from cutting across the major sponsors that the league have and that uh, the league have rights over their major sponsors, but the players can seek agreements beyond that. So the players were uh, keen on reinforcing that and that we reinforce that with the league. Justin, we have Ricky Nixon in the studio as our guest tonight on Talking Footy. How are you, Ricky? Good, thanks, Justin. It's, it's very important, I feel, that the players make these decisions and, and I'm glad tonight that uh, the Players Association has met with the players because it's, the, it's really the players who have got to really stand up now and make these decisions. And, and uh, can you just let us know what players were, were, what group of players were there and how important it is to have them there making these decisions? Yeah, we had, uh, we had most of the delegates there tonight. We had a, a number of uh, delegates who had been briefed, the interstate delegates briefed beforehand and they were uh, they faxed over their, their proxy voting for tonight. But uh, the delegates reinforced the direction we're heading and uh, they understood that uh, there are a number of issues that are priorities for players, particularly the the, uh, the termination payouts, the minimum salaries, and, and basically those minimum terms and conditions we have discussed on a number of occasions. But at the same time, they were also concerned about being consulted in, in use of their likeness and image. And uh, they wanted to reinforce the fact that, um, that the non-exclusive use by the league and, their, and that they be consulted in, in regards to that and that they be remunerated accordingly. So I suppose uh, you know, that, that's to the benefit of uh, the more elite players, um, but also to the benefit of uh, all players generally. OK, Justin, thanks for that. Uh, and you too, Mark, for your efforts tonight uh, out at Ligon Street. Um, Ricky, have you got a long-term plan to take over the Players Association? 
No, I don't think that it uh, should be someone in my position who, who takes over the Players Association. I just feel that Peter Allen needs a lot more help. And I think that what's been mooted at the moment, an advisory board of, or a commission that's been suggested, you know, I'd be happy to sit on that and give input from a marketing direction. But, you know, I feel that Peter's got uh, the expertise in industrial relations and, uh, you know, I think they need some other expertise, perhaps in media, and uh, we could get a multimedia megastar like yourself on there, Mike. <laughs> well, that might cost you a bit. Um, <laughs> we're going to take a break. We'll be back with more on Talking Footy right after this. Today, a little bit about Ricky. He said he was a very fine footballer and he had other attributes as a young man. I remember when Ricky was young, he always loved to wheel and deal. And uh, one weekend during the footy season, when we were juniors, he, uh, he organised a snow trip to up the snow and um, he charged us all about 100 bucks each for the, a seat in this bus. And I think the bus cost him 10 bucks a seat. And he's, he's obviously made about 90 bucks a seat on about 40 people. So that's the sort of like Ricky is. <laughs> Actually, you wouldn't believe it, I did a contra deal on the bus, I got it for nothing. <laughs> the good thing, Ricky, it was a snow trip going to the snow. You got it right. <laughs> Look, after tonight, I just think you and Ross are the best of friends. We got it all wrong, didn't we, Mike? We did, yep. Totally misunderstood the situation. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. And, Thanks, uh, Michael, and Malcolm, I'll be away for a couple of weeks. Sandy will be in the chair. I'll be at the World Athletics Championships. But I'll be tuning into Talking Footy somewhere, <laughs> somehow in Gothenburg next Monday night. Hope you can join the boys then. Monday's experts They always know what's cooking How the game was lost and how it could have been won When Monday comes around Everyone's an expert in my town Monday's experts And Gary Ablett has left the arena Monday's experts This has been a Seven Sports production